This is the Thwaites Glacier. Otherwise known as the Doomsday Glacier, it is the most dangerous glacier on Earth. This is not just any ordinary glacier. The rapid retreat of the glacier is the largest threat to global sea level rise, and also the most unpredictable. Its retreat could leave New York City looking like this, London like this, and Paris like this. How high sea levels rise and how soon has much to do with what happens to Thwaites, and it's in big trouble. The glacier extends 120 kilometers across the coast of West Antarctica. At 192,000 square kilometers, the glacier is larger than the U.S. state of Florida. This glacier is massive and critical to West Antarctica, and that is a major problem because in the past few decades, it has become increasingly clear that the weight is falling apart. This is the Antarctic ice sheet. It is thickest in the center where countless years of snowfall compacts into ice. When the ice grows thick enough, about 50 meters, the layers fuse into a large mass of solid ice. At this point, the glaciers begin to move under their own weight. Ice sheets behave plastically, sliding and flowing over surfaces, covering everything in its path. This movement pushes ice outwards from the center, and the part of the glacier that floats on the water is its ice shelf. Today, man-made climate change is causing the water and air surrounding Antarctica to rise in temperature and subsequently melt the ice. But this is occurring at very different rates. The eastern ice sheet's base is primarily above sea level, making it relatively safe from warm water intrusion, which accelerates melting. This means it is melting slowly and remains fairly stable, but the western ice sheet is different. Most of it lies below sea level, where a deep current of warm water melts the ice from below, putting the ice shelf at risk of breaking away. And this is why Western Antarctica is the most important piece of ice in the world regarding climate change and global sea level rise. Here is a bedrock map of Antarctica. The green, yellow, and red regions represent ice above sea level, like in Eastern Antarctica. But the blue regions represent where the glaciers lie below sea level, such as this region in West Antarctica that already contributes to 4% of global sea level rise annually. In the past few decades, the Thwaites ice shelf has lost lots of ice. This causes the glacier to retreat backwards and increases glacial flow. But the bigger problem is Thwaites' grounding line, which is the point where the glacier meets bedrock. The underside of the ice shelf is melted by circumpolar deep water, which results in ground line recession system imbalances, and intense melting. The grounding line has retreated 14 kilometers since 1992, so as it retreats, ice that used to be on land becomes ice floating on water, raising sea levels. The downhill slope of the bedrock means that as the grounding line retreats, more ice is lifted off the land and into the water, accelerating the flow of ice into the ocean. Furthermore, the gap between ice and bedrock increases allowing more circumpolar deep water to flow beneath the glacier and accelerate melting. This positive feedback loop is the primary concern for rapid sea level rise. The accelerating glacial flow makes the Thwaites Glacier the largest contributor to ice loss in Antarctica. In 1985, the U.S. Coast Guard ship Glacier slammed into ice in one of the most remote places on Earth the Amundsen Sea. Aboard this ship was graduate student Jill Singer and glaciologist Terry Hughes. The ship rammed into the ice repeatedly, slowly progressing through the sea ice. At last, the ship broke through the ice and sailed into a calm, ice-free sea. This was the first ship to sail into Pine Island Bay, Antarctica, the location of the Thwaites Glacier. As terrifying as Thwaites is, little is known of it because it's located in one of the hardest to reach locations in the world. Despite this, Terry Hughes had concerns about the West Antarctic ice sheet since the 1970s. 
At the time, scientists knew of global warming, but believed that Antarctica was too cold to fail. He was believed otherwise. So, in 1985, he traveled to Pine Island Bay aboard Glacier, in hopes of gathering useful data to prove his theory. Unfortunately, terrible ice and wind conditions prevented him from gathering any useful data. To make matters worse, early satellites began using remote sensing technology, which showed that the Pine Island Glacier, as well as Thwaites, was not only stable, but gaining ice at 50 gigatons per year. Hughes still had doubts, but with no evidence to back them up, there was nothing he could do. This remained true until 1991, when the European Space Agency launched a satellite with radar interferometry instruments. The instruments were capable of capturing data at the grounding line, something the previous equipped satellites could not. This new data prompted another expedition to Pine Island Bay in 1994. This time, scientists collected data that showed the grounding line was retreating by 1.2 kilometers per year. Today, this initial calculation holds true, with estimates placing grounding line retreat at one kilometer per year since 2011. Terry Hughes was right. Recent studies have shown that Thwaites' melting speeds are much more unpredictable and complex than previously thought. Data has shown that ocean velocities are low near the West Antarctic ice sheet and salt concentrations are stratified, which insulates the ice shelf and slows the rate of melting. However, it was also found that the ice shelf has highly variable ice morphology. Take a look at a typical ice shelf. The underside is very gently sloping and is approximated to be horizontal. Now take a look at Thwaites. Approximately 800 meters from the grounding line, there are terraces with near vertical walls up to 6 meters in height. Between these terraces are horizontal sections of variable orientation. These horizontal sections are accompanied by low velocity ocean conditions and high stratification, meaning the melting rate is much lower in these sections. The steep sections are met with high ocean velocity and low stratification, making the melt rates up to 30 meters per year, six times the average predicted melt rate. But the melting of the weights is accelerated in another way as well, and it has to do with the water beneath the ice. As salt water comes in beneath the ice sheet and mixes with fresh water generated by friction and geothermal flux, the water has to flow somewhere. Thus, the water flows into cavities in the ice and starts to build pressure. When enough pressure builds, the water can push up a column of up to half a mile of ice, contributing significantly to global sea level rise. These results make modeling and predicting the future of Thwaites complex. Accurate predictions require long-term, widespread measurements. Unfortunately, isolated studies are often extrapolated into inaccurate predictions making research difficult to rely on. The general conclusion amongst researchers studying Thwaites is that much more research needs to be done. This can take the form of an international collaborative, such as the International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration, or it could mean many independent research groups. Current research has given us a glimpse into what the future of Thwaites could look like, but more needs to be done to help the world devise a mitigation strategy. Thwaites is scary, but it's unlikely a total collapse will occur in our lifetimes. That being said, it is contributing significantly to global sea level rise, which has already caused devastating effects to communities around the globe. Now, the future of Thwaites and our planet will be determined by time, and what we do with it. Will we invest in efforts to protect this planet from catastrophic disasters such as Thwaites' collapse? I don't know but I certainly hope that people see that change is a necessarily proactive action. There is no turning back once Thwaites gives in. <laughs>